Good evening, everyone. I, I see a number of folks coming in, the participants. So uh, for those of you that are already on, please know I'm, I'm just filling some time to allow uh, additional folks to enter the, the chat here. Um, but friendly reminder, this is our third virtual day at the State House activity, fireside chat, whatever we're calling it. And we have a very honored and, and, and very distinguished speaker that will be uh, presenting to you tonight. And I think you'll love to hear from Speaker Ron Reitman. He's in his third term as a speaker of the Kansas House of Representatives. And for many of you, and again, I'm just filling time. So welcome to, to everybody that's still joining. I see more folks coming in. But uh, the speaker is certainly a friend to agriculture. He grew up in Western Kansas. And uh, while I don't know if he was directly involved in production agriculture, I've heard one or two stories about how he got to climb to the top of the, the Mead elevator and, and get to you know, see God's country out there. So really excited about this. This again is our third virtual day at the State House activity. The first one was with Governor Kelly. And then last week we heard from President Ty Masterson, President of the Kansas Senate. This evening, we're gonna hear from the Speaker of the Kansas House of Representatives, Ron Reichman. Uh, just another friendly reminder, next week, we're kind of transitioning. The lobby team will provide you a 2021 legislative update, and then we'll actually move into some policy development activities and, and just highlight with our Director of Policy Development, Nancy Brown, will highlight how you can engage not only at the local level through your County Farm Bureau and your upcoming issue surfacing meetings, but also some additional educational opportunities when it comes to policy development on Kansas Farm Bureau's behalf. As we uh, transition out uh, past next week, we will actually hear from a couple of special speakers dealing with uh, interstate commerce and, and meat labeling, both uh, the state and federal inspection side, as well as dive into some of the issues that we've uh, faced throughout COVID on the protein marketing, specifically cattle marketing situation. So look forward uh, to having you all on this, uh, this event or this feature in the coming weeks. Please uh, remember that each one of these is its unique registration. And uh, if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to sign up for next week and then those educational opportunities after that. So. With that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to John Donnelly, a uh, lobbyist for Kansas Farm Bureau, to uh, give a little update on what uh, what's happened so far, week number three in the session, and introduce our speaker. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. I would uh, say week number three, it, it, this week and maybe even a little bit of last week started to have a more normal feel. Uh, and, and the speaker can probably add to this here in a second, but uh, I, I think, you know, the first few weeks we were trying, they were trying to get some things that they that were, very important and needed to get moving forward done and now we're kind of getting back into the the nuts and bolts of government and how it functions um, but as ryan said at the beginning some of you i know weren't on here yet but uh, we are very fortunate to have speaker ron reichman um, <clears throat> the speaker is uh from olathe uh the 78th district i believe his fir your first year being elected was 2012 was the first year uh to be serving in the kansas house uh, speaker Reichman quickly rose to the role of speaker, and as Ryan alluded to, he has actually just was elected to serve as his his third term as the Kansas speaker, and I might add, unprecedented third term. Uh, so, I, I, a blessing or a curse? I don't know if that what what the speaker would say on that, but I think it it goes to show how he's done a good job of managing his caucus. Um, I will say. Uh, as a Johnson County legislator, we have been very fortunate that uh, the speaker has has not forgotten his rural roots growing up in Mead, Kansas, uh, and, and we're fortunate to have him in that role, and he has shown that uh, through many of his committee appointments, whether it be on the tax committee, appropriations committee, ag committee, uh, he has not forgotten rural Kansas, and, and we applaud the speaker for that. So, Mr. Speaker, I will... Uh, I will turn it over to you for some opening comments before we get into the Q&A and uh, all members out there, please uh, submit your questions and we'll go through them and, and see if we can get them addressed by the speaker. And, and once again, thanks for joining us. Well, Ryan and John, thanks so much for having me and if you guys are listening in, appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I, I do appreciate, you know, mentioning this is the third term, I'm a third term speaker and, and sometimes, you know, I, no one else applied for the job. I mean, I was the, uh, no, one, no one else wanted it. So I'm not sure if it's to be congratulated, I should be congratulated or if, uh, if there's something else that needs to be addressed there. But anyway, we, you know, we had some unfinished business uh, last year. Uh, we wanted to make sure we finished. Um, about two years ago, our Kansas Supreme Court 
uh, decided that you had a right to abortion inside our constitution. And I don't believe that. And I don't believe Kansans believe that. And so we worked really hard to pass the value them both uh, amendment, which we need uh, two thirds of the house and two thirds of the Senate to pass to disallow the citizens of Kansas to have a say if we're going to be a pro-life state or not. And and we passed it uh, early on this year. So we're excited about that. You know, I think lots of times you, you wonder, you know, why God puts you in different places or why you know what you're doing. Uh, I thought for the longest time it was to work on budgets and to work on tax policy and work on school finance and work on different things. Uh, but I'll tell you, when uh, the Supreme Court made their ruling, it came very clear to me uh, why we were what we were. And uh, so blessed to be a part of this. Um, again, it's in the hands of the people now. Uh, still lots of priorities to go on for it to pass. Be lots of uh, misinformation coming from the other side. But I know Kansas will do the right thing and uh, opportunity of a lifetime and uh, very blessed to be a part of it. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the main reasons I, I did this again. Uh, we have a lot of things to do. We have obviously what a tremendous opportunity is to be help the state uh, manage itself through this crisis and provide some checks and balances and economic development opportunities and do what we can for the whole state. And that includes um, every county. Uh, we, we know that as different parts of the state prosper, the whole state prospers. And, um, you know, growing up in Mead, Kansas, I was able to, to participate in all kinds of activities um, that some of my kids in Johnson County can't. And, um, and so, I, I, again, I know that, uh, that the, the better me does, the better Johnson County does, the better Johnson County does, the better Elkhart does. And so uh, we try to bring that balanced approach and are excited to uh, have an opportunity to, to make our state better. And again, what a, it's not probably a better time than now. The state uh, needs us to have this type of collaboration. Uh, we need checks and balances. We have some opportunity during this crisis, but I think we can come through it and make the state better. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I uh, appreciate those opening comments. And uh, I guess I would, I'll start off with the questions. And then once again, remind members and those watching, uh, if you have a question, uh, submit it through the question and answer or uh, chat function. And Ryan and I can, can see those and we'll try to get as many of them answered as we can. Uh, I guess I'm just going to throw you, I, get, I don't know if it's a softball or not, but uh, it's what's on top on the top of everybody's mind. And that's COVID. That's how the state has reacted. Uh, uh, how, where we're at in the process of, you know, the Emergency Management uh, Act and, and any revisions to that. Um, unemployment insurance, the fraud that's gone on there is top of mind uh, in the press and, and at the State House right now. So I guess I'm just going to lob this one out there for you to take in whatever direction you want. But how do you feel the current COVID situation uh, has, has been handled? Uh, and more importantly, where do you see us going from there? We can all look back, but we need to be looking forward on this issue. So I'll just throw that one out there. What are your thoughts on, on COVID and how the state government will continue, has reacted and will continue to react? Well, I think probably the biggest difference you'll see from Republicans, myself, and maybe some of the Democrats and our governor is that we firmly believe that Kansans to, to help themselves and get through this and know best. And I think others maybe think government's the only solution. Um, I, I'm, you know, COVID is a real thing. Uh, I, I had it. it. It does affect people differently. It put me in the hospital for a while. Some folks, it just, they lose the taste and smell for a while or have a bad flu. So it does discriminate in how it, it, it affects different people. I know we all have loved ones or, or folks that we know that passed because of COVID. So it's a real thing, but it doesn't mean that we can't function. It doesn't mean that we have to shut things down. Um, and we're very really alarmed. We wanna make sure that doesn't happen again. We don't want one person to be able to pick winners and losers, deem who's essential and who's not. And so the response we're having this time is to make sure those checks and balances are embedded. Our, our laws were basically built around floods and tornadoes. They weren't built around in pandemics and things you can't see. Um, and so there's a lot of powers given to one person and to our old laws. And so we're, we're looking at those. I think one of the things that really kind of caught our attention early on when the governor uh, said that you couldn't go to church and that if you went to church, you can go to jail because of it. And that's not what Kansans believe. That's also not what I think is not even constitutional. Uh, during the time, we weren't encouraging folks to go to church. We hope people can go online or, or participate in other ways. But we couldn't stand for you know, being able to say, hey, you can go to jail because you go to church. And so there's, there is some differences between a Republican response to a pandemic and a Democrat one. And so we're excited to be here to help with that process and provide checks and balances. 
to make sure that can happen, we kind of set this place up, the state house, kind of like you would a business or your farm, uh, to make sure that you can you can continue to operate during a pandemic. Uh, again, the virus is, is is real. It does discriminate a little bit on how it affects people, but what doesn't discriminate is your time in isolation or quarantine. And we want to make sure our reps are here and our senators are here to do the work you sent us to do. Just like you want to make sure your employees are around to make sure you can get the work done, needs to be done. And so we we set up our committee process. And so all our chairs are six feet apart. Everything's on a Zoom uh, or a WebEx. In fact, you can testify from your office or from your home, home living room. Um, but we want to make sure that if we can continue the work of the people uh, during a pandemic. Our, Senate, our house floor looks a little different. Uh, half the chairs are removed. We're using our galleries and our floor both. Uh, it was kind of a helpless feeling last year when we had to leave early and we left all that control to one person. There wasn't much we can do. And I don't know how many folks have said, hey, we had a bill get through, but it didn't finish. And so we really took some time to prepare for this session. So far, it's going well. In fact, we had all 125 members in that chamber today up in the gallery on the floor. It's the first time we've all not, somebody hasn't been in quarantine. And so we are pretty excited about that. It seems to be working, um, but we have a lot of work to do. Again, we want to provide lots of checks and balances. Uh, we believe that the people, uh, the locals probably know best for their community, that their state is diverse. There's a lot of different ideas. Uh, I personally believe in masks. I think they're effective. Uh, I don't believe in mandates. Um, I don't hope my dad's not listening, but if you tell my dad and me, Kansas, to wear a mask, he's not going to wear one. But if you encourage him to wear one to protect my mom, he'll wear one. And so we, we, we talk about how masks are important, uh, maybe, you know, much for yourself, but those around you. And so, um, we're, we, we encourage them. In fact, we, we have about a thousand of these made. And if you can see, it has a nice little buffalo on it. That's also near dear to my heart because it's the mascot of my, of my high school. Um, also in Garden City. So we'll give Garden City credit too. So it's a Southwest Kansas mascot that we have a lot of people wearing right now. So, um, you know, the, John, you, you've touched on unemployment insurance. And um, I like to be more positive in these calls and not be the bearer of bad news. But this is a big issue. Um, we worked really hard a few years past to get our unemployment trust fund in a very good place. I mean, as you're trying to run a business or recruit people to come to our state, you, you obviously have high energy costs, you might have high taxes. And one of the things that you'll look at is your unemployment insurance premiums. And we want to stabilize them and make them fair. Well, Kansas, we're going to basically bankrupt the system and our unemployment uh, costs are going to go through the roof. Uh, a lot of we had a lot of who a lot of fraud going on right now in Kansas. The um, there's a lot of organized crime and overseas activity. Uh, a lot of our system basically has been breached, and lots of information has been uh, seeped out. In fact, I bet you half the people on the call uh, have received 1099 Gs showing that uh, you received benefits when you didn't. Um, earlier today, I was talking to a group of um, presidents from our our small colleges or independent colleges and. And I said, you think that your board or at least notified you before they fired you. And so the state giving you a, a form showing that you were on unemployment. Um, so we try to make light of it, but it's a, it's a serious deal. Kansas right now is number two in the nation in number of claims per week. That's not per capita. Um, you know, uh, we had 66,000 claims a week ago where Nebraska had 2,500, Missouri had 11,000. Uh, Illinois is the only state that has more claims than we do. We have more claims right now than California, more claims than New York. Um, hate to do this, John, I should have probably gave this, but here's a little chart we like to show people too. Uh, the top line is basically the national average you see in March, our unemployment spiked and then leveled off. The lower line is Kansas. You can see where in March it spiked and then leveled off and then just took off. And this right here is the fraud that we're seeing. Um, that's causing our, our system to collapse. Unfortunately, that money uh, needs to be paid back. Um, it wasn't just unique to business, small to businesses, it's also our schools and our nonprofits, our churches. So it's a big issue. Uh, the federal government's warned the governor's office about it back in March. We have, the business community has continually. Uh, it wasn't until last week, we finally got back in the building, had hearings that the governor really realized that's an issue and finally put security measures in. And I think I heard her say today that they stopped about 600,000 folks trying to hack the system in one day. To give you a little idea of how uh, corrupt the system was. One more st stat I'll throw out there is we have about 1.5 million folks that, can, or, that want to work in Kansas. We had over a million unemployment claims. 
I think we're under a 4% unemployment rate, so the math does not add up. We have a major problem. Unfortunately, well, a lot of our businesses won't know what hits them until they get their new rates in December. And we're hearing they could be tripled or, or worse, and you could be, pay more in unemployment insurance than you do in state income tax. So uh, we're right now diagnosing the problem. We're going to do our best to do what we can to make it solvent, to make it smooth and out as best we can. But it is a major issue. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad you jumped into the unemployment insurance issue. While, you know, th th obviously there are many ag producers that have uh, employment or employees, so they, they do have to pay in into that at some level. But the fraud has affected everyone, as you know. I mean, people that are self-employed are getting unemployment uh, filed on them. And I've heard numerous comments say, I, I mean, I've been doing a pretty poor job, but I haven't fired myself yet. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a major problem and we appreciate your leadership. And I know you've been really working on that. I'm going to ask one more question that I actually wanted to get into before we've, we've got numerous questions coming in from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, and Ryan, after this one, I might turn it over to you to handle a few of those. Uh, but, but one thing I want to mention is uh, Senate bill 32 from 2019 session, uh, and, and I was reminded as I'm I'm listening to you of the first time we brought this issue to you uh, in your in your office. Uh, we we were giving you the sales pitch and talking about how well we need to have the ability to be able to sell these health plans. Uh, you know, basically it let the free market work, and and you stopped us and you said, "Did you say freedom? You had me at freedom." Uh, and I, I want to, number one, thank you. Your support and leadership on that issue was key. Uh, you and Senate leadership uh, that year really were very important to helping to make that happen, and that is not lost on us. Uh, but we also know that healthcare is still, and rural healthcare is still something that's out there, and uh, I guess I'd just, in thanking you, I'd also give you, like to give you the opportunity to to have any, do you have any other thoughts on some directions maybe we could go with rural health care and improving access? And then after that, I'll have Ryan ask a few questions. Yeah, we, we know having access to care is vitally important. That's what you want to continue to uh, grow and, and thrive. And everybody wants their loved ones to be able to have access to, to care when needed. One of the things that, that uh, we pushed last year and again this year is our um, rural, we have a rural hospital innovation fund that we're promoting. It's basically take a little bit of government money, a little bit of private money and put them together and go out and really study how to right size the care in, in rural Kansas and find out exactly what, 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 what is needed and kind of take it from a, what's the customer base need? What's the size of the hospitals need to be? How do they work together? And, you know, we have, there's, there's some funds out there over $2 billion that are trying to help rural hospital and they seem to be focused more on uh, Medicaid expansion, which it may be one tenth of the solution if somebody thinks that's the solution. I personally think a lot of those funds end up going back to the, to the more populated areas. Uh, we want to find solutions that we know make a difference. And um, we, you know, it's, and, and I tell you, we, with, on top of that is broadband and telehealth. You know, I had, I'm, I live in the Kansas City area and get a chance to be close to KU Med. We have some of the world's best doctors uh, and, and healthcare providers right there in, in, in Kansas. And they're spreading out across the state. But more we can do would help uh, some of those doctors get out to see all areas of the state. And I think, again, telehealth and broadband are big parts of that. Well, Mr. Speaker, we must be on the, the same wavelength because actually the, the next question is uh, dealing with broadband. And, you know, I, I guess it may be just helpful. And, and I'd love your comments on this kind of a, a sideline. But you had the privilege of actually serving in the Kansas House with your father. For a couple of different sessions, which I th certainly think is unique, and certainly as we talk about generational transfers on on the farm, you know that that's near and dear when you get two or three uh, generations all kind of in the same operation, same building, etc. So certainly love your your input on that. But I know your father and, and your mother, uh, they probably still talk about it. We certainly know Representative Orr is, is a true champion for some of the lack of broadband, specifically there in Meade County. Whether it's the, the federal, you know, COVID package that had some broadband uh, money in it, whether it was the, the ITE transportation bill through KDOT, that there was some seed money for broadband there as well. The SPARC committee uh, at, at the state level, they've also discussed this. Where are we uh, in the Kansas legislature now, not only reviewing previous packages that, that have had some money for broadband, but also more forward thinking, how do we get broadband to Fowler and Meade, Kansas? 
Well, one, we have a commitment to it and, you know, all the way from our federal government down to the folks here, we know it's vitally important. It's, it's infrastructure. I mean, you look at uh, Western Kansas, or rural Kansas now, and, and the towns are there. It's the ones that are built on the, on the, the railroad, the ones that have the, the grain elevators. I mean, that's uh, broadband is going to be the same thing uh, where you have to have information. I know, uh, I know for, for me about two years ago, I, I toured the state again and met with a lot of our members and talked about, tried to, it was more of a, uh, the first time I ran for speaker was kind of convincing folks to vote for me and, and kind of listen to the second time I ran, it was much more of a listening tour. And I remember sitting right in, in Boyd's living room and he talked about this and talked about the importance of not just Highway 54, but he talked about the importance of broadband and what it cost the, 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 the lawyer to, to have access to what we need. And, and it just, it was a great reminder to me to say the importance of, of the connectivity. And we briefly talked about it, importance of it for healthcare, but in the business community and boy, right now, even education opportunities out there, um, we, we have to do what we can to continue to invest and, and find partnerships. Uh, I wish we could have slowed down that process a little bit of the CARES money. I think we could have done a better job targeting uh, to economic development and broadband. It's one of the key things there. Um, uh, but, you know, we do with best we can at the time. But we, it's definitely a, co a commitment that, that most of us up here have. And we'll continue. We, we all know the importance of it. And we know what it will do. And, um, you know, maybe it's kind of cliche, but what the railroad did, something the same to, the, to, to Kansas, the same thing I think happens with broadband. Well, great. We will uh, continue to search for members all across the state that are willing to speak up and, and tell their story because you're exactly right. Telehealth, uh, remote learning, but, you know, just the, the ability to buy, sell, trade and, and conduct business in the 21st century is absolutely imperative that, that agriculture, you know, not only the, the shop or the, the rural house has high speed fiber to, the, to that physical presence, but we also have to have the wireless so the precision agriculture out in the field can uh, still do what it needs to do. Kind of staying on the same wavelength, what, what are your thoughts on economic development? I know there's a, a lot of star bond conversations. Those are more you know, focused on some of our urban corridors, but, but where do you think uh, economic development in, in rural communities may, may go this session or uh, in the future? All right, sorry about that. I hit a button there. Um, you know, I, I th you know, I think we have, need to keep all the tools we have and refine them to, for the best we can. I tell you, we we passed some things last year that we'll pass in this year, some of veto that were, I think um, will be very very helpful. Uh, we had the Cam the Kansas Promise Act, where we had folks that in a trade school or a two year uh, program that if they would promise to stay either continue their work inside a four year program or work in Kansas for two years that it'd be paid for as long as it matched uh, industry that was needed in Kansas. Uh, that was passed last year and the government vetoed it. We didn't have time to override it. Uh, we think this year we'll, we'll make it so we, the governor can sign it, but we have the votes if she doesn't want to. So we, that's gonna become a reality. Uh, we, I think passing the um, we, a property tax transparency bill to kind of keep our property taxes lower. Again, that was also vetoed. Uh, we have the votes this year to make that happen. Um, I think those will be very important. Uh, to our, to our entire state. And so I think um, we had a, another, like a first time home buyer program uh, that we didn't get through the system last year, but it's kind of works a little bit like a uh, 529 college savings account. Uh, where be, I think it'd be great for, for rural Kansas where um, even the community can put some funds together to, uh, to attract a certain type of profession that they're needing. Uh, a family member can set money aside to keep their have their student return home uh, instead of or excuse me their, their kid to come home to their area but those are things that we'll keep pushing through um but i, I tell you that unfortunately for us right now the some of the biggest things um is this unemployment fraud that's going on that's going to really i think depress us a little bit we're going to try to work through it um i you know I think getting folks to wear, wear masks to get the vaccines that they want to to get us back to school um, and get us back to normal, and probably all pretty some low hanging fruit things that we all can work together on. Yeah, I guess I one question we've got here from the the, the listeners uh, is is related to vaccines, and it's this is really I think not anything that at this point is within your purview, but I, I think it's 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 on people's minds. 
you know, in rural Kansas, there's there's many counties that are at least perceived or the the, the, the constituents and the, the population out there perceives that the vaccine rollout has been extremely slow. Uh, is there? I I know the answer to this. I, there's really not a lot the legislature can do. But what are you hearing from your people? And 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 are is are we making progress on that front in your conversation with the governor and the administration? Like I say, I know this is. This is an administrative issue, but the question's out there and it is top of mind to members. Yeah, this again is, it's uh, we're more oversight. Um, we don't have a direct say in this, but we we try to offer suggestions. You know, the, a lot of people have been frustrated with it. I talked to folks in, in Johnson County. They don't think they're getting a fair share to folks in Central County, folks in Riley County. You know, they just, wherever you're at, you think another county's getting more than you are. Um, and there's been a, some, some hiccups there. Uh, I know a lot of our larger businesses that deal with logistics every day have offered to, to the governor's office, hey, let us help you with this. This is what we do. This is how we make our living. We're experts in this field. And to, to date, uh, they haven't been uh, receptive of that help. And so that's a bit of a frustration. I know the federal government had a, some of them didn't come out as quickly as possible. But the concern I have is that dam gets broken free and those vaccines come in. Do we have the infrastructure in place, the plan in place to get them to people's arms for those that want them? as soon as possible. So we have some issues with the logistics and the lack of wanting people to help. Uh, a lot of us feel that when you don't know something, that's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. Uh, we're not sure that always translates uh, to, to, the, to everybody in Topeka. Um, so we think that'll be very important that, that we continue to, to, to find out how to, when it does break free to get these out. It's also the prioritization of who's getting the shots. Um, I'm all for uh, folks that work inside a prison uh, to get a shot, but the prisoners shouldn't be in front of our firefighters, in front of our teachers, in front of our bankers, in front of our farmers. Um, and so there's a, especially we have so, so few and, scar and it's a scarcity right now. Um, I think the prioritization, again, it's not something we have control of, um, but we still influence and we talk and, and try to to prod where we can. Mr. Mr. Speaker, if I can kind of keep along this, and, and I know this is also coming in from the audience, one of my favorite meetings uh, to kick out the session is always coming to your office just for kind of the courtesy, welcome to the, the new session. And you love charts. I don't know if that goes to back, back to your basketball playing days. You, you want to know your free throw percentage and all that other stuff. But walk us through the budget. I mean, you, you've shown charts historically when it co comes to K-12, when it comes to some of the social services, which I think, you know, are directly tied into some of the COVID situation. But where are we at from a state budget perspective, not only now, but say three or five years from now? Yeah, we, our budget projections are better than anticipated, which is great news. Of course, when the pandemic hit, our estimators really depressed them. And so we're, we're exceeding a de very depressed um, estimate, but still it's good news. Um, the problem we have is that when we passed our last school finance bill that satisfied the courts, uh, we said very clearly that, you know, we want all kids to be educated. We, we know that K through 12 education is very important, but we didn't want to make a promise that we couldn't fulfill in the out years especially. We wanted to make sure everybody had certainty, including our taxpayers and also our schools. We thought that was a fairness issue. Even then we said that there's really no way the out year shows it pays to be paid for. Uh, we mentioned that you you couldn't have a recession. You couldn't, you know, obviously COVID happens. And so we, we are okay for the next couple of years, but the out years do not look very good at all. Uh, this year, once again, the, the cornerstone of the governor's budget is a reamortization of our, of our pension system. Uh, just last Friday, our pension board rejected the idea once again, and it's about 177 million a year. And, uh, and it's just not a good idea to cost the taxpayers over four, almost $5 billion in the future. And so I'm pretty confident that we'll reject it again. And so there's a lot of work to do. Um, again, I know you guys were, were helpful when we tried to maybe balance out some of the spending. And so the legislatures and you through the legislature had more say in our spending. Unfortunately, about 90% of our budget is tied up in social services, our CAPERS payment, and also K through 12. So it does leave a small percentage that we, that we can have other discretionary spending on. Obviously, we want to continue to fund core functions of government and invest where it's important. And so there's still some work to do. Um, what I'm in, kind of one bright spot is if, if we all can get together and work together, the amount of money that came into the federal government, uh, I think over five of a six billion dollars, six hundred billion dollars came in through K through 12 this year. Um, there's some more money that came in for transportation. There's more money that went in other areas. 
if we can all get together and say, okay, what do we want, or excuse me, what do we need right now, not what we want, I think we can get through this and, and still fund um, the core functions of government and invest, government and invest where we need to invest. Uh, we just have to be willing to talk about our needs and not our wants. And, and uh, again, there's about almost 600 billion more money going to K through 12 this year from the federal government and about 244 million of state and general fund money that's going to K through 12. And uh, again, very important. It's K through, it's very important. Uh, public education, education is great. Uh, I just want to, my concern is the, is the rest of the budget and in mental health, telehealth, broadband, all of the things we want to invest in uh, our highway system also have to take a priority. Yeah, but well, great points, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and and I would say, as you know, uh, as we the last time we really dealt with the uh, with the uh, uh, budget or the K twelve budget issue, uh, you know, we were involved in the coalition uh, looking to towards a constitutional amendment uh, to to basically put more of those decisions in the hands of the legislature and. Uh, uh, you bring up the the amount of money that has went to K twelve and and I, I don't want this to sound too cynical but I th that money th there's always I suspect we'll be told that they've been had drastic cuts when it, that money doesn't show up in the future and I, I fear that we'll have a similar discussion uh, and I look forward to your leadership it's, it's nice knowing that we have someone that has such a grasp on the budget. Um, and in, in the role that you're in. And, and I think it's also important to uh, the role you have, not only understanding urban legislators needs and your constituents needs for your home district, but also the needs of the state and rural legislators. So uh, with that, I guess I'll just ask one final question that I think is at least top of minds of us politicos in the world. Uh, as we go into reapportionment uh, and redistricting here in the, the next uh, year or so, uh, I guess mostly next, it'll be mostly next year's next legislative session. Uh, how do you plan to approach that? And I, I, I butter you up with all of the accolades of your ability to manage urban and rural issues. So uh, anyways, I, I'm just curious how you'll, you'll handle that going forward. And then after that, any closing comments? Uh, we've probably maxed out our time, maybe even went over a little bit. So I apologize. But what are some closing thoughts? And, and as we move into redistricting? Well, first, Ryan, I'm sorry I didn't bring budget charts. Those are my favorite. Um, in fact, I get made fun of a little too much for all my charts, but I did mix one chart in, um, but I've got more if you had more time. Um, but, you know, redistricting obviously is very important. Uh, we're waiting on the, the census numbers and it, it's, it is a math problem. You know, um, we want to protect the, the real Kansas the best we can with those positions, but it is a, a math issue as more folks move to the more urban areas or move out, uh, that this, it, does, it naturally makes it a transition. But we'll make sure we'll protect the districts, um, the, the, the boundaries and the folks that are out there. Uh, there is a little bit of variance. Um, if you look at the, even as a, uh, this as a Republican, the, the higher percentage of Republican legislators are from rural Kansas. And so my, if I had a bias it is to continue to have, have rural Kansas represent the best it can, because uh, a lot of the issues, you know, I think it might have happened prior, but a lot of the issues we have are not, I don't see them as much as urban and rural. I see them more just, you know, conservative and liberal. And, um, you know, like I said, just how we're approaching COVID right now. It's, it's do Kansans know what's best or does government know what's best? And I can tell you that almost every single legislator that's from rural Kansas believes that Kansans know better than the government. And so naturally, we want to see those type of people represent us up here in Kansas, up here in Topeka. So uh, we'll continue with that. But again, it is a math, it is a math problem. Um, and it's, and, and we'll, we'll do the best we can and, and try to make it as fair as we possibly can. And as far as closing comments, again, thank you so much for, for allowing me to spend, spend some time with you. And I, uh, I can't tell you how excited we are to be able to pass by the vote to give the people of Kansas an opportunity to say if we're going to be a pro-life state or not. Um, the, the opportunities we have right now uh, are great. Um, we, we're going to keep a positive attitude. We're going to do as best for our state. Um, that's what's great about being a Kansan. And we appreciate all you guys do for our state and appreciate you guys uh, allowing me to spend some time with you tonight. 
Thank you so much, uh, Speaker Reichman. This has been fantastic and we've got a great audience on and, and we certainly look forward to 2022 when we can invite you to one of our in-person meetings when we get back to, to being able to do that safely and appropriately in Topeka. So just thank you for your leadership and, and your accessibility, not only to Kansas Farm Bureau, but members back home and in Mead, as well as uh, your constituents in Johnson County and keep up the great work. All right, thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Good night. Have thank a great you. evening.